Thank you for your patience. I just wanted to take a moment out. Um, this evening I'm going to explore one of the great sutras of the Buddhists called the Lagavatatra Sutra. And I chose that because uh, I spent some time studying this with Alan Watts many years ago, and this was the central sutra that a group of us studied together for a couple of years. So getting back into it and rethinking it is a fond experience. But before I get into it, I'd like to read you just one quick paragraph, actually a part of a paragraph, in uh, Suzuki's commentary on the Lankavatatra Sutra. And I'm reading on page 285. One of the most important things that students of Buddhism have to realize at the very outset of their study is that Buddhism is not a system of philosophy. Has nothing to do with speculations as such has no intention to present a logically coherent formula of thought. What the Buddhist teaching professes to do is to get us truthfully acquainted with the ultimate facts of existence. It requires us firmly to grasp facts based on personal experience. Once this is attained, including intellectualization and theorizing and philosophizing, will follow by itself. So that's the way it starts. It's not a, not, it's not a logically coherent system. As a matter of fact, if you try to read it that way, you will realize quickly that it doesn't have an ordered structure. It doesn't have an ordered structure. It doesn't proceed with any grand design. The whole isn't captured in a series of integrated parts. Rather, it takes its subjects as subject matters, separate, distinct, and then pieces them together in a, at times, a random order, because their intention, and therefore, is not to present a logically coherent formula of thought. That's quite right. They didn't do it. What they did do is something else, so that's what I'd like to get to. What is the line of Atara Sutra? It's going to present one idea, and it only has one goal. It wants to get to the point where you can see, realize with the mind, of course, to understand just one idea, that everything Everything exclusive, excludes everything, excludes nothing. You have to understand that all is nothing but mine. That's the goal. Now to do that, they go through a particularly interesting development that combines a philosophical and psychological perspective, which I'm going to try to represent. Now, to do that, I thought what I might do is to quickly contrast it with a Platonic view, because then it will be much easier to see it as a whole. And I'm going to pull out for the moment just the fundamental ideas of Plato's Timaeus. Plato's time is, is a cosmology, and it really starts with uh, there is a god, a demiurgos, right? Ergos is to work, right? A demiurgos, and is god, the dog, a maker, ergos is a maker, a, a worker, a demi is a god. It's a god that produces. And in order to create, he first, of course, must look upon himself and using that as a model, create the universe. So therefore, 
in the mind of God, as it were, there is a model. This model then becomes the basis that the creator then creates the universe. And therefore, it's beginning and end, right, cycles again and again and again, is already contained seed-like in the model. Therefore, the universe as it unfolds is nothing other than working out the implications of that model. The entire thing, therefore, in the mind of God is a model, and one interesting word will capture the whole thing. If you have a model that includes everything as a whole, simultaneously, a simultaneous whole, Now, what does that mean? That means that, take an example, if you can take uh, man, mankind, man, and if you can see how he emerged, right, where he is and where he's going, if you can see that entire development as a whole, simultaneously, as if it were a seed-like in its... In its uh, compactness and beauty, then you would be seeing the image of man under the aspect of eternity. Under the aspect of eternity. Therefore, the whole thing is there in all of its completeness, it's not going anywhere, it's complete in itself, and it's simultaneously as a whole. So too the entire universe. Through all of its forms, it's all compact together in a model, and it's this, the mind of, in the mind of God, therefore creation is nothing but God reflecting upon the idea in his own mind, that's the model, and which that is used then with the skill of creation produces the entire universe from beginning to end as it cycles its way on and on. Now, with that in mind, simple as it is, I'm going to now take the Lankavatantra Sutra and read into it. Now, if you could, let's picture this for the moment, a moment, look here. Suppose it was possible to be able to, in some way, catch a glimpse of this most directly. Then, it's not active, it's complete. It contains everything. It contains all the forms that are there. It naturally, since it's not doing anything, it's simply reflecting them, much like a mirror would. It contains everything, only in a simultaneous whole. Therefore, we can picture this as if it were a mirror that contains all, all forms. So we'll make a mirror out of it with my artistic ability here. You can see that's a beautiful looking mirror. Right? Now, therefore, that contains everything from the beginningless past all the way through. It contains all possible forms. It preserves in itself the entire development which later is carried out in its transformation. You see, the interesting step in creation is that from this aspect of eternity, it must move into time, for time allows it to unfold. So as it enters into the realm of time, it unfolds what was before, you might use the term and say, what before lied potentially within it. Therefore time, of course, then is nothing other than a moving image of eternity, right? That's all it is, right? A moving, moving image of eternity. Now that's called the Alia Vijnana. All right. Now 
Vijnana, of course. Jnana means uh, a way of knowing. Uh, Vijnana is the five senses. So therefore, if you could look directly into this, what you would see then would be in itself all the memory of from the beginningless past and into the future. It preserves it there. And as such, it's ready for evolution. It's like an ocean without waves, but everything is there. It never acts, just perceives. In such a case, what is known and knowing is one. Now, there is something now that emerges. Hmm. Ah, let me get a marker. Now, there's another principle that develops beyond the Alia Vijnana, and that's manas. Now, that's a principle of individuation. What we can call, right, you have here, now we're in man, you have manas. That allows you to intellectually perceive things, right? It can discriminate. Now, in seeing the entirety, in seeing the entirety, this, this would be, uh, in Hindu terms, uh, when vision, when Arjuna, when Arjuna has the divine vision, in Book 11 in the Gita, Arjuna asks Krishna, he says, Krishna, show me your form, show me your splendid form. So Krishna says, okay, I'll show you. And what he does is just unfolds what lies here potentially in time. And that goes through a terrifying experience as it goes on and on and on until finally Arjuna says, I've seen it. Because if you were to see this in a brief period of time, you would then see the whole creation of universes come into existence, pass out of existence, different species, rising and fall, civilizations, rising, being engulfed in flames and passing out into non-existence. You would see a fury you could see it all in such a brief span of time. That's Arjuna's vision. And finally he says to Krishna, hey, look, I've had enough, please hold back, return to your everyday form, and he does that. That is, you see, being able to see, discriminate this, the Alya Vijnana, through the manas or the intellect. That's what it is, see? And in that way, then you can react to it just like Arjuna did. And he's affected by it, uh, passions, desires, fears, he struggles with it. But through that manas, there are two things that are primary. And that is, you see, there's a struggle for existence in that and supremacy. So therefore, when we then catch in any way uh, a glimpse of this from our figure here, Within the intellect, we have some principle within us as human beings, and that is the struggle for supremacy and equally the struggle to grasp existence. So that comes together. The struggle for existence and not just mere existence as survival, but for some kind of supremacy. Now, this idea of supremacy lies at the heart of the Lankavatar Sutra because that means then within us, Within us, we want to aspire for, for something that is terribly profound. And while we can have other kinds of goals, within this Alya Vijnana, which is, as we were talking a moment ago, that's somewhat like the, the idea in the mind of God at the moment of, of, uh, of creation or preceding creation, therefore, within it must therefore be all the stages, all the stages possible for man's development. Uh, 
And therefore, among those stages, there must be certain kind of earthly struggles, but then there must be the particular stages of development that in Buddhism are called the stages of the bodhisattva, right, which is the um, far-seeing one. Uh, a, a bodhisattva, sattva, of course, is uh, what is uh, bodhi is mind. Therefore, a bodhisattva is someone then who can grasp the nature of being with the mind. He can then grasp what is. And they are stages until there is a complete and pure, perfect enlightenment, which, of course, is the uh, historically said to be the Gautama Buddha. Now, once that manas is stirred up, right, and you, you have a struggle for existence and supremacy, that awakens the five senses. That awakens the five senses. And therefore, the five senses come into existence because what you are doing is nothing other than in the realm of time, struggling to achieve an experience which is nothing other than the idea is the mind of God. Putting it, in, again, in Platonic terms just to uh, talk about it. Right? Now, there is one other thing that's very curious. The manas functions with what is called the uh, manavijnana, which is uh, a particular faculty. They're joined together. They're joined together, they work, and this is the intellectual, uh, you might say the, the uh, intellectual discriminations necessary for dealing with the phenomenal world. So uh, in Western philosophy, this is very much akin to Kant's categories. That is to say, within the structure of the, of the mind, there are categories which allow us to uh, integrate much of our experience because it passes through the basic categories that are needed for the formation of thought and therefore it allows us to engage actively the world of appearances. Now, uh, therefore, let's go back. What is it now? We have this person, hypothetical person, who grasps in one flash all that is in the idea of the mind of God. That's the Alivijnana. Right? In order to do that, uh, you see, he, there has to be some transformation of man because let's work backwards now. Normally, the five senses focus on the phenomenal world. This is our phenomenal world. Ah, and to focus on the phenomenal world, we also need uh, uh, this intellectual apparatus that allows us to understand through these categories our experience. We then have a way through that to intellectually engage the world of appearances. This is the world of appearances or our everyday world. Now it's through that that we cling and desire, etc. Therefore, and the Buddhists would say, now, you know what you have to do? The whole goal of getting into this higher stages of man's development, there has to be a revolution. There has to be a radical turning around to break through this tie to the phenomenal world, which is nothing other than the particular ideas of the mind of God unfolded in, in uh, time. And that's called a par paravriti in uh, Sanskrit. Uh, it's turning the mind around. It's bringing about a revolution, a turning about, breaking the tie with a phenomenal world, freeing manas and the manavijjana, so that therefore this perception is therefore possible into the mind itself with alia vijjana. Now, uh, and that of course that produces the world of particulars. Now. Let's look what we have now. Right? Now, through this, through this, your experience, through your experience, we need another faculty called the Chisita. Right? That gathers together, gathers all the consequences of whatever deed, whatever thought, whatever idea, whatever action you engage in, 
Therefore, it gathers all karma together, and that becomes part of your own inheritance. But that's also working out the implications that with lies here, too. It's all programmed in that sense. Now, um, what can we say about those? Well, it's very clear. Now, let's go back to the major idea of the Lankavatakra Sutra. Therefore, the only thing we're ever engaging in continuously is nothing other than mind only. That's all it is. And mind only means nothing other than mind. The world is nothing other than mind. There's nothing but subject objects and both are nothing other than mind. The triple world, nothing but mind. Existence itself is nothing but mind. All is mind. Mind evolves. Mind evolves. All the forms to which all the forms are manifested because the mind evolves to all the forms that are manifested because all of those forms lie potentially within this model. And therefore, it naturally follows, therefore, if we are going to be involved in a developmental model Sooner or later, all beings, therefore, must move from their particular struggles in the phenomenal world to mount these steps of the bodhisattva ideal. And that's an entry into Buddhahood. Therefore, each of those stages represent uh, levels of enlightenment, which at the same time means their willingness, therefore, to help others see the nature of ultimate reality. And um, nature of ultimate reality uh, is a, uh, what they call a yatabhutam. Uh, that's seeing things just the way they are, which is nothing other than mind. So we need, we need a revolution in consciousness and the whole system of the vijnana. That's the, uh, vijnana just means the five senses, by the way. Uh, we must see most clearly our emancipation and our freedom from this involvement. That takes a direct perception of things the way they are. No. It's only one thing you're going to encounter when you see things the way they are, and that's that this is nothing other than mind. Projection of mind, our participation in projection of mind, and therefore, it's mind as an idea going into a platonic world for a moment so we can play with it. Um, it's a participating in mind as you understand mind to be the ultimate reality and that's all there is. Now, to go into a more, more interesting, I'm gonna push the implications of this now. What is mind and how do they talk about it? Now, in the sheets I passed around, I passed these sheets around from Suzuki's translation of Lankavatara Sutra. And um, I would like to direct you to page 186. Yeah. 186? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. This is the uh, most interesting part of Lankvatartha Sutra. The abodes and stages of Buddhahood are established in the mind only, which is imageless. Now, I'm going to uh, read quickly through a couple of the items in order to go on to what I think is more central. Now, it previously to this section, there's a description of the 11 stages. And this is where he redefines them, the author. Um, the first seven stages are still in the mind, but the eighth is imageless, the two stages, the ninth and the tenth, have still something to rest themselves on. The highest stage that is left belongs to me. 
All right, now here's where we're going to explore it now. Self-realization and absolute purity. This stage is my own. It's the highest station of Mahaveshra, the Akanishtha, heaven, shining brightly. Now look at the way in which they're describing it. Its rays of light move forward like a mass of fire. They who are bright colored, charming, auspicious, transform the triple world. Of course, some worlds are being transformed, others have already been transformed. There I preach the various vehicles which belong to my own stage. So I'd like to stay with three and four. Mahamati, in ultimate reality, there is neither gradation nor continuous succession. Only the truth of absolute solitude is taught here, in which the discrimination of all the images <clears throat> is quieted. So it is said that the abodes and stages of Buddhahood are established in mind only. All right. And now we're going to get to that stage that is left to me, this is of course said to be the Bodhi, uh, Bodhidharma, because this was given to Wei Qi, his disciple. All right. Now that stage belongs to me. What is it? Self-realization, absolute purity. Oh. What do we have here now? Of course, you need my figure back. All right. Now, this last stage, that's what we're looking at. This belongs to him, right? That last stage is the stage of self realization, absolute purity. I can use the shining brilliantly. That's heaven. Krishna is the Sanskrit word for heaven. Right? It shines brilliantly. Right? It shines brilliantly. Its rays of light move forward like a mass of fire. Right? Bright colored, charming, auspicious, transforms the all that is. Therefore, what we have here is a doctrine of mind only that has a set of characterizations. We can characterize it, we can say we can name it, we can name it in this way. This therefore allows us to say there is in fact a realization. Therefore, this person realizes that this is nothing other than in the highest sense, the self, self-realization. It's an absolute purity, shining brilliantly. Its rays of light move forward. What is this and to what can we liken it? I'd like to introduce three ideas. The first idea is, goes back to Arjuna in the 11th book of the Gita. Before the unfoldment of the entire universe in time, he has a, a most brilliant light experience which he describes as, it's as if 10,000 suns were suddenly blazing itself in the heavens. That's a light experience, all right? That's a light experience. 
Certainly. I'd like to think now if we can go back to perhaps a talk we had once before about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead of the Evans Vents between 96 and 99, they make two interesting distinctions. Intellect, consciousness. Now, this word shines brilliantly, can be understood in two ways. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a clear example of how these terms can be used. Intellect, when it's pure, when you can turn about and, and see the very nature of the intellect itself, that's a turning about, that's a turning about, a power of vritti, this is still a turning about. At that point, it's called an experience where one recognizes the thrilling, shining nature of the intellect itself. Now, there are two uses of the word light and brilliant. One is clearly the example we're just using. The other is much more profound, I think, but perhaps we can talk about it. Sometimes when you're out on a very, very clear, sharp day, cool day, perhaps in the mountains, and you can be suddenly struck by the wonder of a certain brilliance that isn't light. It isn't light. It, 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 isn't, the, it isn't something that is shining. It has a, numin it has a, a numinal quality to it, like a numinosity to it. It is pure. It's empty. They describe that as pure consciousness in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. These are two different experiences, therefore. Some of the same terms can be used for both, but the one set in its totality cannot be used to describe the other. Third case. In Plato, in the Republic, and in part of the Phaedrus. He talks about the difference between the good itself, or the one, and the idea of the good. Now, as you undoubtedly know, it is a mistake to use the word idea as if it were a concept. It should all be always used as a capital, because the word idea is a Greek word. It hasn't, it just hasn't even been anglicized. Idea. It means to behold. It means to see, to behold. So with the experience of to behold the good is described as the most brilliant light of being. That's what this is called. The most brilliant light of being. Now, the most brilliant light of being has such power and immensity that in the allegory of the cave, when anyone comes, has the experience, it's so overpowering, it strikes them with, with such tremendum, such uh, over, over, overpowering experience that one has to adjust to it. It's an overwhelming experience. Now, the good, also called the one, and this can be found in Plato as well as Plotinus and Proclus, especially uh, Plotinus. Uh, I should add before I go, uh, you can find this very clearly in Plotinus. Plotinus talks about an idea that sparkles and glows. That's what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a luminosity, an experience of luminosity. Um, now, when he talks about the good and the one, he says, no predicates are possible. No predicates are possible. Can't call it light, can't call it anything. It's beyond all classification, no possible way. You can't even say it is reality. It's beyond reality. Now, here again we have something that shines brilliantly in the idea of the good. We have it in Plotinus. We have it in Proclus. 
The good itself is beyond all categories. Therefore, it's beyond all dualisms. Now, you can also say the experience of the luminosity that one experiences as pure intellect or mind. There's also a non-duality because the uh, knower and known are one. No distinction between knower and known because there isn't any separation. There's an all-encompassing, engulfing light experience. And if you uh, enjoy making comparisons with Christianity, uh, this is called in Christianity the uh, Transfiguration Experience in Book 9 or Chapter 9 in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and it's also, by the way, in, in Homer, if you want to go back to Homer in the Iliad, uh, several very beautiful examples in that, in the Iliad as well. But now going back, what do we have here? If we make a comparative study of it, just as we're doing, we will have to say that the lack of a Tatra, as brilliant as it is, and has such a use of brilliance and light experiences, has really talked about, in Platonic language, in Neoplatonic language, the idea of the good. If we talk about it in terms of the Gita, that is that overwhelming experience of Arjuna in Book 11 that preceded the experience of the unfolding of time. If we talk about it in terms of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, this is a clear example of uh, the overwhelming light experience that occurs at the moment of death or between two thoughts, or between uh, sleep and awake that one is able to access. But very clearly, for the Tibetan Book of the Dead is an experience of the pure intellect, but not pure consciousness. Therefore, there's a similarity, theoretically, between pure consciousness of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the idea of the good and the one. Equally well, in uh, Hindu terms, uh, the Madhyuka Upanishad, um, with uh, Gaudapada and Shankaracharya's commentary, very clearly, the idea of Turiya. Turiya, the fourth, the fourth part of Aum, the fourth part, is purely a non-dual. It's a non-dual in which no description can be made. Therefore, it has a kinship with pure consciousness and the good and the one. And therefore, this uh, interesting study of the Lankavatara Sutra brings forward and returns, you see, it turns everything around in Buddha, as the Lankavatara did, because it goes back to the fact that there is a self, not an anatman, but an atman, a realization of the self. That even though we can call it absolute purity, it's still talking about something as, as real. And though the Lankavatara Sutra does use the idea of shunya, or shunyata, it doesn't stress it at all in this work. And equally well, uh, the triple body of the uh, trikaya is only touched uh, somewhat because it appears that it, it may have been too early for the development of the trikaya movement in Buddhism. Therefore, all they have is the nirmanakaya. Um, but to talk about something as real is not to say shunyata. It's talking about something that is, that has these qualities, and therefore it can be described. Now it's a magnificent sutra. I'm not in any way criticizing it, obviously. But I think we can approach it in a comparative way and this is what I wanted to bring to your attention tonight. So, hope I uh, can answer some questions for you. Thank you. Should one read the Republic of the Dead? 
in order to understand Plato? Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, one must become educated. There's a certain way of reading Plato. Um, it takes such strictness of reading. One has to approach it with great integrity and follow every metaphor and link it all. See, as this doesn't have an organic whole and structure, Plato's Republic has a vast and intricate structure which plays on levels of meaning in a very, very magnificent, beautiful way, but not just for artistic reasons. It carries a level of meaning throughout the whole and uh, especially the way he unfolds the dialectic, and, and uh, I presume you're familiar with it. Um, yes, I think that's probably one of the works that is probably least understood in, in uh, the academic world, because most people want to take it as a model for the, re for the state, a republic, and they forget that the subtitle is righteousness, dikaiesuin, you know, which, which is not legal. Our, our use of the word justice, has a legalistic side to it, but that isn't the side in the Republic. Dick Yaisuin is righteousness, you know, it's a higher principle. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sir. In using Plato, mm -hmm. you use the idea of God. Yes. But in the Lankavatara no. Sutra, there would not be no, no. the concept of no. God. No, absolutely correct. They would object to it. Yes. I did that just to try to show that there's a way of talking about the Alivijana, because in all of those characteristics, it can be said to be similar. Though the Lankavatara Sutra adds some things that Plato didn't have, and therefore it's a very nice thing to bring into it, such as its mirror-like quality, the fact that it isn't active, the fact that it is something that contains everything in it itself, and in order to I brought in the idea into Lankavatara Sutra, which doesn't have it, of course, is the difference between eternity and time. That comes from the Platonic world, but I use that to help make the bridge and make it more uh, accessible, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I picked up a couple of colors from one while I was painting with the other. Yeah, it's quite right. <clears throat> How does the silence uh, play into the um, Ten Thousand Suns and that brilliant, uh, yes. brilliant uh, uh, in its offset to uh, to uh, the idea of the good, which is the spoken word? No, no. The idea, uh, the idea of the good, uh, is the spoken word. Maybe you should talk more before I say something. Uh, it, it is a spoken word. Logos, you mean? No, I mean the spoken word as opposed to the silence. How does it play in, in, in that brightness of the light that you described earlier, the 10,000 uh, suns? Um, which is what you find as... Mm -hmm. yes, go ahead, go ahead. Which is what you find when you're up in the brisk air on the mountains as you yeah. contrast into this yeah. Yeah. immense feeling. Yes. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to take you off a bit, but um, <clears throat> um, the thing that we don't spend too much time on, which I really think is very important, is um, the, uh, hmm. You see, this works, Lankavatatra and a good deal of philosophy tries to make clear or to, or to um, make accessible to our understanding the relationship between this and the universe. And so much attention is paid to this that the really the higher and the more interesting question is this relationship. That's the, that's the real problem. That's the magnificent problem. And the only one I know who, who uh, deals with it in depth um, 
uh, is the uh, um, sixth Aeneid of Plotinus, seven, the seventh, that's called six, what's called six, seven. And if I can introduce you to it, you'll find a magnificent study of this from uh, um, 21 to 42. Now, let me see if I can take it out of this obvious abstraction here. What is it he's trying to do? What he's trying to do is say, look here, given the fact that the idea of the good, or what we are now calling the most brilliant light of being, a magnificent transformative experience of divine luminosity, he has two problems. He wants to say how this can become a model for this. And he deals with that from 1 to 20. But he's, what's very interesting is how he can talk about the relationship between these two. Because uh, there are all kinds of interesting uh, descriptions of people who have had this divine luminosity. You know, it's overwhelmingly beautiful. And, they see in the moment the nature of mind itself. Uh, they see there can't be anything more real than that because everything after that is in contrast to that and therefore we get the sense of the phenomenal universe. And in it there's a bliss that's exceedingly powerful and overwhelming in some, some times. And it, it is for those who experience it an ultimate experience. But this is not an experience. An experience has a beginning, middle, and end. It is something that took place. This is not an experience. When, you, when someone who has had this hears of this, they get very upset. They're very upset. I've seen it many, many times. Because it's impossible to conceive from it that there could be anything higher, because nothing else can be higher. There can't be an experience higher than that. But then to deal with the possibility that maybe there's something that is not an experience that transcends this in both dignity and power, that's a very profound challenge to the person who is identified with that experience. Rightfully, you know, rightfully. Yes. And this? Yes. We have to go back to what you erased there, but the, the first circle that you had of the demiurge, with yes. the mind of the demiurge, and then yes. the steps going up yes. to, the, to the brilliant light yeah. on top. Mm -hmm. I perceive that that brilliant light, or that Buddhahood, is something that is, has stepped up on top and outside of the mind of the demiurge. So I would relate what mm -hmm. you're saying mm -hmm. now, that the idea of the good is mm -hmm. likened to the imagination of the demiurge, because it, as you've drawn it out, that within that imagination was the beginning, the middle, and the end of the universe, and mm -hmm. that, would be key, mm -hmm. that would be constantly present. Mm -hmm. And yet, mm -hmm. there is something, in my mm -hmm. perception, beyond that oh, sure. itself, which it seems to be the same relationship that you're talking about now. Yes, I just caution you about the word using the word ima imagine, mm -hmm. because therefore it has no reality. You just imagine it. It has no reality. Yeah, when when one imagines something, one isn't dealing with a reality. But the mark of that experience is that there can be nothing higher in respect to an experience of reality. Now, I think you might be saying, if I if I grasp what you're saying. You're saying, but still it's in the mind of God, as it were, and what's in the mind of anything is going to be an idea or imagining something. Is, is that not correct? The I way you're reasoning? It's, it's outside of that, of that particular mind that you, had, that you had created. So being outside of that, it's, it's completely free from that continuous beginning, middle, and end mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. constantly, mm -hmm. almost, mm -hmm. 
prison-like, that the universe will stay inside that beginning, middle, and end as long as it's inside the imagination of the yeah. okay. demiurge. Yeah, sure, yeah, quite right. But in terms of, of their principles, in the life of Dr. Sutra, uh, there isn't anything else. There's nothing outside of mind. Right, there's nothing outside of mind. Mm -hmm. it, existence is nothing other than mind. All is mind. So therefore, there can't be anything that transcends it for this. And mind, or whatever is described here as mind, then in the final stage is described in this way, which is the highest stage of Buddhahood, just to bring us together. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, just to try to uh, grasp this, um, how similar or different is it from Bishop Barclay, who, who seems to be oh. saying that it's um, really the world is, is mine? Um, this, is a, this is a pure idealism. You're quite right. Absolutely. Yes, this is a pure idealism. Yes. Oh yeah, this is, this, formally, classically, this is a pure idealism. Like Vakantra Sutra, is, is we would class in, in Western philosophy as a pure idealism. And therefore belongs in the class of writing such as Bishop Barclay. Oh yeah, quite right. He would say everything is mind. Oh yeah, everything is mind to God. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the idea requires a mind then, right? No, it, that's, it's not that use of the word. It's, see, it, it's not the use of, see, we want to say this belongs in the class of concepts, thoughts, as activities of a mind. Yeah, the word idea, this is one of the big problems in Greek philosophy, that uh, traditionally, the people who've translated Plato, when they get to this word, uh, 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 idea, they just take I, D, E, A, idea, that's the way it is. Well, that's not quite fair, you have to explain, what, you know, why not translate it? Literally, it means to, to behold, to see, to behold. It's a, Therefore, there must be something in the, that man has that, that it is possible to turn about. In Plato, there's a turning about in the seventh book of the Republic, where you have to turn about, you have to turn from the world of becoming to the world of being. That turning about is very much like the power of Riti in the Lankvatatra Sutra, which is turning the mind away from the senses, same kind of thing. So this really, uh, just to... In classical thought, this really should be, I think, a better way of talking about it should be intellect. Right? With a capital I. That ability of the mind to perceive. Uh, and what it perceives, therefore, must be the intelligible. The intelligible, therefore, in, uh, in this system, therefore, would be being. Right? Intellect, therefore, perceives the intelligible. The intelligible, therefore, means what you're dealing with is the nature of being itself. And being is experienced as the most brilliant light. So those, that's a sequence, you see. It would be a very nice thing to do to uh, take that Plotinus thing. That's, that's an absolutely magnificent piece of work. Uh, um, I've never talked about it before. It's a very nice opportunity to make me reflect on it. <laughs> Another question? Um, that intelligible uh, perception of being, no. if I were to have that, that would be my own good, the one perception of being, my own. When you say your own, no. Well, it is not something you can possess. It's something you participate in. Yeah, it's a participation model. Okay. It has an independent existence. You participate in it. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Well, I, 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 how do you think that the cycle uh, can be broken into uh, 
21st century that that indeed uh, the curve uh, has a, uh, a flaw and that there is there, the mind is nothing beyond the mind certainly but that the invention of the intellect can be re, uh, the words can be reinvented put forth so as to uh, make the consciousness uh, win there is more work today being done in, in the philosophy and in the scholarly world on Neoplatonic thought, as they call it, than there ever has been. Ever has been. Um, there are now institutes, there are conferences, new books are being published that had never, could never have been published 25 years ago. There's a magnificent commentary of Plato's Parmenides done by Proclus that's just been translated. Um, uh, there's a whole new development in, the, in philosophy called uh, philosophical counseling, and they're bringing and studying the processes of meditation in philosophy for the first time in a Platonic world. Uh, this is unheard of. You know, 25, 25, 30 years ago, I can assure you I was there at the time. <laughs> Please. Are the Platonic archetypes, as they're referred to, like you know, the, the ideas which Socrates speaks of as being those realities that have to be participated with for anything to have some of mm -hmm. the realities, mm -hmm. qualities, or whatever you want, or are they inclu included under the that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Beauty itself, justice itself, yes. Yeah. Um, there's a way of seeing how they necessarily interrelate in such a way that you can then cross the, use that as a bridge to understand that this experience would necessarily have that luminosity quality to it. There's a way of arguing and, and bringing a person through it. I don't know, I don't know we, we have time, but uh, it's quite possible to do that. That is to say, it is possible to talk about an experience of beauty itself, to show its kinship with uh, the idea of justice in the Republic. It's quite, e quite natural in the Platonic world to show that the idea of justice itself depends upon bringing together um, uh, a oneness in oneself, which is the precondition for a vision. It's a natural product of that to see how that fits into a dialectical development and training of the mind for vision. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's quite, that's republic. That's so republic. then, I, I missed the very beginning, but I've heard some of these Sanskrit terms before. It's clear to you the uh, Alia Vijnana. No. That's, that's the totality mm -hmm. of the mind. That. That is all that is seed-like, perfect, that then unfolds through our experience using the mind in the way in which we do. Therefore, that's all that really is. That becomes, becomes mind only. So, part of the, the turning pure, around. Pure idealism, yes, pardon? This part of the, the turning around. The yeah, 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 yeah. That self-perception of the mind, or yes, yes, yes. There's a there's a turning about upon itself, yeah, a part of it, and uh, that's the uh, 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 that's the metanoia in uh, Greek, and uh, that plays that turning. See, noia, nous. That's nous the highest aspect of the mind, of the intellect, meta is to turn about, to turn about you, to turn about the intellect so that you can then use it as a vehicle for seeing the nature of uh, what is. Huh. A few minutes ago, I thought you were gonna say more than what you did. You were talking about the the idea of the good and people having that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And you said that that was somehow antithetical to that person grasping the good or the one. Yes. Yes. Why? Because it's not, you said because it's just some, the good or the one is not something to be experienced. That's right. Not then why does it exist? Why does it exist? Yes. Okay. Um, there, now we're going to enter into the realm of metaphors. Um, the nature of the good and the one, uh, the only term for it is unlimited. Now, um, the influence, the influence, and the, what they often consider it like in literature, right, is that just as a candle, necessarily when lit, right, there is an outpouring of light. So in this metaphysical world, this outpouring of light is the luminosity, luminosity. This is the good itself or the one. Therefore, uh, that, and and uh, to shift gears in Plotinus, you can say that the vestibule of the good is beauty itself. The, the, the entrance way. And I have, uh, there is a theory, which I don't hold, but uh, uh, though I pay attention to it and reflect upon it at times, there are some people who claim it is possible to go through that luminosity and go through it, as it were, into uh, a pure experience of the good and the one by itself. But uh, uh, I only heard it from one person. I've never seen that idea any other place except from this one person who claimed it for themselves. Uh, Question? That, um, that intelligible participation in being, that, that being you're talking about is the luminosity? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for letting me share it with you. I enjoy it. And thank you. <laughs>